going live. Oh, hey, and I'm live on YouTube Live, and this is uh, something new because last Wednesday I tried um, Facebook Live, and I got a little bit of response, but nothing too um, overwhelming. So uh, my daughter encouraged me to uh, try YouTube Live, and uh, YouTube is becoming a the driving force in um, being a, uh, one of the primary search engines anymore, let alone one of the uh, top social media platforms um, across multiple generations, whereas Facebook, I think, is more for uh, some of the older, it's become known as an older generation type thing. So uh, I have a, a YouTube channel, which I've done a photography tutorials. I just posted one a couple days ago on um, the advantages of using a prime fixed focal length lens versus uh, zoom lenses um, for landscape and nature photography. And so um, I'm going to be posting more of those and um, and I'm being encouraged to do a little bit more moving around and demonstrating uh, rather than just talking. So I've got that in the works too. So, um, but I just wanted to just try this a live broadcast out on uh, Wednesday evenings, eight o'clock, and see if it can generate any kind of um, activity. So, uh, photography, what's going on right now? It's a lot. I mean, it's the uh, huge impact with social media right now, um, especially Instagram. And there's been some items in the news uh, recently um, regarding the crowds and the parks. And I want to talk about that because that's a big concern. And I've noticed that because I've been uh, conducting workshops in Hocking Hill State Park here in Ohio, which is probably the most scenic state park in Ohio. It's getting international recognition now and you go there now and you start to hear some other languages being spoken because of all the uh, press that it's getting and um, people are always amazed they can't believe it's ohio and it's something that's been very special to me that i've uh, photographed in there for uh ever since the late 70s when i first got into nature photography as a uh, in middle school so it's it's a very special place to me um, but I remember when it was, you know, you go there and you had most of the park to yourself. And now it's um, become uh, crowded with uh, visitors so much so that there's hardly anywhere else to park on weekends. So um, when I do my workshops, I used to do them on Saturdays or Saturdays and Sundays. And now I'm doing them uh, just on Thursdays and Fridays. And it's actually better. And I'm getting better response with that because people are willing to take that time during the week just to avoid the crowds to have the kind of the a space that's needed to really explore nature landscape photography as art in order to do that it's it's not anything you just can go jump out of the car and rush through lines of people and get your uh, instagram selfie in front of the waterfall that's not it. And that's unfortunately become all the more uh, common thing that you see anymore in the parks. But it's just not in the state parks um, in Hocking Hills. Um, it's now become a very big problem in the national parks. And I know some of my favorites that I've been to, and I lived in Utah for three and a half years. And so I really love the national parks in Southern Utah. That's where I kind of reawakened my love of nature and landscape photography in the late nineties. Um, you know, I go back to Zion national park at least once every other year or so. I went back in um, December during the week of Christmas, thinking that I have, you know, not to deal with crowds, but unfortunately, that was not the case. It was um, it was amazingly packed even during that week. So uh, recently, I saw a picture online of the line of hikers waiting to get up on Angel's Landing in Zion, and um, I mean the line was just going on and on and on. And it's just like I don't know how you can get into a place like that and really fully appreciate the beauty of it without having some space and peace. And I mean, that's the way I've always connected with nature. That's 
what nature has always been for me is to go out and be in those kind of places. So I, um, you know, and I have that same approach with my photography. It's always been that way. And I've always uh, kind of stayed away from the group thing, even though I teach group workshops. But when I teach, I teach and I don't do a lot of shooting unless I'm demonstrating. So, um, but when I'm shooting on my own, I, I really uh, like having this space and peace and time to be able to take my time and work the scene and uh, be there without any, you know, lines of hikers is coming through and, um, you know, being asked to, hey, can you take a shot in front of this waterfall type thing? Um, teenagers, dogs, all that stuff, uh, which can be kind of fun sometimes, but, you know, when you really want to work on getting the scene right and capturing it right, um, it can be pretty counterproductive. So I um, just noticed that this, these crowds are coming into these places unlike any other time before. And it's now, it's you see it in the articles and the rangers, the state rangers and the national park rangers are actually saying it's because of social media, because it's like, it's driving this because they're watching these visitors. They come out, they got their cameras, their uh, phone cameras, iPhones and whatnot. And they have the selfie sticks. And I saw it when I was in Zion and they want to get in front of something very scenic and get their picture in front of something very scenic that's impressive. And then immediately post it on usually Instagram and then follow maybe down there a little bit as Facebook, but it's really Instagram. So, um, and then they jump back in the car and they go. And it's like, <laughs> hey, you know, this is, these places are spectacular. You go into, um, you know, the, the canyon in Zion, um, you go into um, up on Logan Pass and Glacier National Park, um, you um, or in Grand Teton, uh, or you're in, you know, you name it. I mean, arches. I mean, uh, just these places, are, they're just spectacular. But even in Hocking Hills in its own right is um, a, is is amazingly beautiful place in order to really appreciate um that beauty, you really had to take your time. And um, not only that, but you get a good hike in too. <laughs> so you like you're you're there, you know, throughout different times of the day, and you can see just how much um, the, the the particular season, how it's being, um, and the light is coming in, and things like that. And it just you know, you, you grow an appreciation of it. Um, also in, in studying the, the flora and fauna of a place. And I've shot in these places so many times. I, I don't call myself a biologist by any mean, but, means, but, um, but I'm pretty good at identifying the animals in these places and uh, especially with the bird life. And also most of the wildflowers I know from photographing them for years and years and years. And it's when you take the time and see what's actually there, it's, 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 it's amazing. It really is. If you're just rushing in and just kind of trampling through and not taking the time to look at what, what's at your feet, you know, you know, what's hidden back behind this little a cove or in this hollow, um, you know, if you, you're going to miss it. It's just, it's all becomes all about more. Okay. The, the driving motive, right, is, you know, my being impressive on a, a social media platform like Instagram or Pinterest and showing a really cool picture of me being, you know, super hiker and this amazing waterfall. And it would, that's your motive rather than truly experiencing a place and learning to respect it. And that's another thing, too, because I notice a lot of these um, kind of they come in and go get their selfies and get out. They have a tendency to be a little bit more um, prone to leaving garbage behind and uh, just from observation. And so uh, which is really not cool. So um, I think the people that really spend more time in these places, respect these places, um, they're not going to do that. Right. So uh, that's another the thing I want to comment on, but from a photographic standpoint, you know, like I said, when you go in and I go in with um, DSLR equipment and uh, I shoot Canon and I have these uh, um, 
a pretty good selection of lenses that I've built up over the years. This is, this is my system. I have a professional grade tripod, ball head, you know, all that equipment I'm hauling down in these places. And if I'm going to make the effort to haul that equipment in, I'm going to, I'm going to make the use out of, um, get the use out of it. Um, what I'm trying to say is that's all about part of taking your time and um, not just running in and getting the quick camera phone shot. Um, which, you know, that's okay for you know, somebody who's just starting out or somebody who's just visiting a place for the first time, that's understandable. But when it becomes just so predominant, um, uh, these so many people that are doing that, it can get um, it can get frustrating for the photographers that are there to really, what I say, spend time and work the scene. Find the creative angle. Um, take the time and wait for the the light to be just right, you know, when it's um, not overly overwhelmingly bright sunlight and you've got a nice even light to work with. And there's been times I've been doing that in, in Hocking Hills and all of a sudden a crowd of people, just as the light is just perfect, will come right into the shot. And it's just, it, it takes some patience to um, you just realize what's going on there and be understanding and and just wait them out, and sure enough, you know the goal go along, go off. But it's it'd be it'd be so much better if it, you, you, I, photographers didn't have to have to worry about that constantly right now. So um, yeah, so it's it's an issue, and I just would you want know, to talk about that a little bit on the Facebook Live, um, and I'll this will be posted on my channel afterwards, and you can comment there too as well. But, you know, what do you think? I mean, is it becoming too much? Um, what about protecting these places? Um, you know, if you look back to the, the, the um, what I would say, the photographers that are the masters, you know, Galen Rowell, Ansel Adams, these guys that went in, I would say guys, but there's more and more women too. So, um, that would go in and they, they had a lot to do with these places being recognized as national treasures and being set aside as national parks for preservation and protection. And um, what's happened now is I wonder what they would have think if they saw the crowds and the traffic coming in these places, you know, uh, back up a traffic in Cades Cove, a great Smoky Mountain National Park, where all of a sudden um, a few black bears are um, a black bear mother and some cubs come out god forbid and they literally get mobbed i've seen this they get mobbed by um photographers and uh and i just shake my head at that i go oh my god no <laughs> that's not wild uh wildlife photography but that is is trying to outdo somebody else and out compete and get the better shot for the camera club uh <laughs> so I'm not a big fan of that because, you know, these are wild animals. You have to give them their space. You have to uh, stand back and not harass and stress these animals. Animal Wild animals are subject to stress just like people are. And nothing stresses them out more than being mobbed or tracked down by um, humans with a bunch of cameras. So that's something... That, you know, as a photographer, there's an ethical uh, consideration, right, uh, for the subject. So that's very important. So, you know, like uh, getting back to what I was saying about the masters, you know, what would they have? To, what would they have to say right now if they saw all this going on? Um, you know, so it's it's it becomes less about respecting and honoring the place. And it seems like there's this this thing going on in society right now. And it's not just this particular subject of, you know, the selfies out in the national parks with the crowds and the and the people in the um, the state parks as well. It's also a something that I think it's um, uh, in, indicative <laughs> of society at large where we become a um, instant entertainment society do this the Faustian bargain, the deal with the devil with social media. It's become, um, everything's instant entertainment. Everybody wants instant likes and instant fame. Okay. And they're willing to do anything to do it. That's sad. It really is. Um, and I think this is all part where I'm talking about with the photography and the crowds, 
you can see it elsewhere in society. And so, and then everything seems to be, everything seems to be imitation these days. And it's just like a very a slight variation of the same thing over and over again. And um, there was an excellent article, and I'm kind of kind of segueing into the entertainment industry, but it's all connected because it all pertains to this bottom line issue that seems to be permeating everything we're doing as a society, society right now. And that was an article in the New Yorker regarding, as this came out, I think this morning, uh, regarding the Star Wars brand. And I know it's kind of a nerdy thing, but, you know, I grew up with Star Wars. I came out when I was in seventh grade. So it was like, bam, it was a huge influence on me um, back then. And it was so original, right? Even though it really um, took a lot from the classic Westerns um, as more fantasies and science fiction and all that. But uh, there was some, it, it, it hit everybody by surprise because of the originality of the, of the whole story. Um, but what's happened now is it's become this uh, corporate brand that's being rehashed. And these newer movies are lacking, they don't have any legs. What I mean by that, there's no substance. They don't have the characters that the originals had that people can really put their hearts around, right? And that capture the imagination. Um, they're more just kind of like a fake, imi this, this cheap imitate, they're all cheap imitations. And it's, you can see that. And um, with so much going on, the photography you see seeing posted on Instagram and, and social media, it's, it's like, wow, so-and-so got into the spot. I'm going to go get in that spot and I'm going to outdo that person. It's kind of like what I call, I see it in the, like the camera clubs when you get the old retired guys that get way too serious about their competition and they're always out to outdo each other. <laughs> it's just like, and they get so serious, they get, they, they get angry. And I'm like, wow, and you know, what's your motive? Why are you, why, what is it? Why are you pursuing photography in the first place? Is it to, is it a continuation of something you left behind in the corporate world? And I know this is pretty harsh, but I'm just going by what I observed. And if you, if you disagree, you can comment and let me know. Uh, or um, are you here to really, uh, because of, you love photography? You know, my workshops, unfortunately, I get a lot of people that mostly are the ones that love photography. And they range anywhere from the ages uh 14 to you know early 80s and um so it's it's um it, it's but i know the types that would just like you know they just want to outdo somebody all the time and i think once you get caught up and it's all about motive everything is about motive when we do um our work when we're uh, putting together working in our art it's like it the motive is going to come through. And that's what people are going to pick up on when they see things that you create, whether it be in music or writing or photography or painting. You know, is it um, is a competitive motive to outdo and then just imitate somebody else? Or is there something there that people can see and go, wow, I can see a, a, a part of that person's personality in his or her work? And when you see that, you know, you got somebody who's doing it because they love the medium and they're not there to outdo somebody else. And that's where the best work comes in. Ansel Adams wasn't out there to outdo somebody else. Uh, his contemporary, Edward Weston, uh, also, he wasn't doing it to outdo. I mean, they were just there, just um, they were the pioneers in the art form and, and they really... Um, but they just, they found it. it was almost like the Wright brothers. I'm reading the book on the Wright brothers right now. Um, where is it? David McCullough. So, um, and so you think, why, how's this related to photography? Well, it is because you read about these guys and what they did and have they stuck to their vision and their passion because they, the work they put into it, it wasn't, it was never about um, outdoing somebody else. Um, they're motivated by what other people, other um, early pioneers in uh, powered flight, had, uh, but the ones that were starting in that direction, but they studied and studied and they developed their own way of doing things. 
because they loved it. And so it's like, and look what happened. So um, then look at the work of Ansel Adams. I mentioned Weston and um, you know, Paul Strand is another one that comes to mind. So um, yeah, so digital, you know, as like I said, um, I teach uh, communications courses uh, during the regular school year at uh, School of Advertising Art. I teach uh, an introductory communications course that's primarily public speaking, but I teach an advanced course on communication theory. And we talked about this, um, and one of the theories we talked about uh, mass communications was this idea of the Faustian bargain, this deal with the devil that we make uh, when we adapt and we adopt, we adapt to and we adopt this new technology. Okay, so uh, it's tremendously, it's convenient. It's, it's so easy to use, but we don't think sometimes, and it's like the classic line of Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park, I know I'm a movie nut, but uh, it's in my blood, I love movies. Um, in Jurassic Park is, is you spent so much time trying to think if you could do it, you didn't stop to think is uh, uh, if you should be doing it. That was, that's not the exact line, but you get the gist. Um, it, because, you know, what are the ramifications? What are the things that we're losing on the backside of things? So um, I'm seeing it right now. And a lot of the um, the photography that, I, that I'm witnessing online and social media and whatnot, um, there's some beautiful work out there, no doubt. Um, but there's, I think, but there's a lot of imitation. And uh, it's just... And photography is one of those things that's like, well, how can you not imitate somebody else in nature and landscape photography? You go, well, it becomes more of a case of knowing your sub, being connected to your particular subject. What I mean by that is your place. And this kind of leads into another good point I've been talking about in my workshops is uh, photographers, uh, especially newer photographers or serious amateurs, they kind of go by the belief that I'm not going to get the great images, right? Unless I spend the money and I go out to Yellowstone or Glacier or Arches or, you know, down in Death Valley or somewhere like that um, or exotic like Hawaii or the Caribbean or even, you know, off into Iceland or somewhere like that. And um, until then, I'm really not wanting to, you know, do much in the way of, um, photography around here and I said yeah but you get out to those places you got one week compressed if that um, you're dealing with crowds you don't know the area and then you're going to try to remember all the things you may have read in the manual hopefully or if not uh, taking a workshop we have taken one of mine hopefully you'll remember it a lot easier so it's like um what my point is, is like, and you end up photographing the same thing that a lot of other people photograph. And um, I can't stress this enough. Photographers, you're going to do your best work right outside here. Uh, there, see, back there. Right outside the front door, um, right outside the, you know, down the street at the local park. I mean, those are the places um, you find your own place, and you 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 see it. You recognize the seasons, right? You know that light, how the light changes, is unique to this particular place throughout the seasons. Um, I've got a couple of local places here in the Dayton area near my home on the Five Rivers Metro Parks, uh, Sugar Creek Metro Park. I photograph all the time because it's it's seven minutes down the road, but I can get there when I know the light is going to be good. I, I get there when I know I got a dynamic sky to work with. I know what angles and what settings I'm going to go for. So it's like, it's really important to, um, you know, find your own spot and hone your skills and be connected to that spot. Uh, Hocking Hills, you know, I go back there all the time because, but I've been going back there. I've been, Going, I've been shooting there since the late 70s. So it's, yeah, it holds a special. I know there's some of the little special spots that are kind of, that I connect with almost like on a uh, spiritual level, so to say, because to me, nature photography in its purest form is, is a meditation. 
So it's a meditative art. Um, you find your your area and you 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 connect with it and you hone your skills and you hone your your uh, creative vision with these these local spots that not everybody else is you know crowded into trying to get the same image and um, I think that's more important today than ever before because of what's like I said what's happening with the crowds that's not it's not so much even an off season and and a, an on season and off season anymore at these places. It's all year long that the crowds are coming in these places, and it's this. Um, it's great to experience, but you really could probably going to do your better work finding your own local spot, whether it be in Ohio or Michigan or Indiana or you know wherever you're from. There's there's beautiful places everywhere if you take the time to really look and be open to the possibilities that's outside, just outside your front door, okay, and down the street. So that's really important. Um, I know that's what's driven a lot of my work, and I, and I talk about that in my workshops because I get asked, okay, where should I go? Where should I go? I go, well, do you ha what's the closest park? Uh, what's the closest woods to where you live? You know, so is it somewhere that's, that a lot, of, a lot of people don't know about? Um, you know, work there because you have the space, you have the peace, you have the time. It's so important. And I, it's another issue is I notice a lot of these crowds that come in and they're just rushing, rushing, and rushing because sometimes they're in a big group, especially the national parks. You see whole busloads of tourists get out and then they rush them all back in. And it's just like, why? <laughs> you come all this way and you don't really spend the time in a place. It becomes more of like kind of a mob, boom, 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 you know, going from one place to the other. So um, I don't know. I, I, it's just like, yeah, I, I, I feel like I'm comfortable in giving this advice and saying, hey, yeah, those are great places to go, but, you know, you're going to do your better work somewhere close by home, Okay. So somewhere you the light, knowing the light of the seasons. In Ohio, we have very um, four very distinct seasons. Okay, and I'm always looking at the light, and so it's like, and it, it's so much to the point where it does kind of impact my enthusiasm just a little bit. Um, you know, spring number one is my number one favorite season in Ohio. It used to be fall. I don't know why, the order I get the most about spring. Uh, two is um, autumn, uh, fall. And then um, summer, winter are <laughs> close uh, tie for last. And I'm going to tell you why, because right now we're at the tail end of a beautiful spring and early summer. And so I'm trying, I'm been doing out, getting out a lot of good shoot, shooting in. I've been doing a lot of workshops and um, teaching. So um, this is a great season, a lot of good energy, right? Um, because I'm a creature of the light <laughs> and I know the light of the seasons. I know when the light is good and when I know when it's not so good and when not to go out and shoot. Um, so it's in, in addition to the time of day, but time of year, time of season two. So uh, we're now we're coming up in July. Um, July is my least favorite month, one of my least favorite months for outdoor nature landscape photography in Ohio because the light and the light is overwhelming. It's it, the humidity levels shoot up and that makes the light just go blah other than very early dawn, early morning or um, after sunset. Occasionally you get some nice thunderstorms that come through that mix things up and clean, cleans the air. It gets the water flowing again in July. And I've had some good moments in July. So, um, and my birthday is in July too. So, but it's it's just when the light becomes too much, it's too overwhelming. And they talk about seasonal um, mood disorders, you know, with winter. But it's been proven it happens in the height of summer too, because it basically what it is, it's it's you have too much of one thing. In winter, it's too much darkness, and in the height of summer, it's too much light. You know, so you know, as artists and photographers, we we love those uh, in between times of late i love now when there's a big transition to getting to late so i really like late summer though um when you get late summer and the fall um it kind of things coming back in balance and it's just like 
the photographer, the artist, it is, it kicks, it kicks in that energy kicks in again, um, just like it does, um, beginning like April through May into June. Um, uh, but you know, fall is my other favorite time and actually all the way through November. Um, I don't have a, I don't struggle a bit until, uh, in Ohio until really, uh, about Christmas. And there's, there's, yeah, about Christmas all the way through, Oh, most of March is like, I'm glad I'm teaching <laughs> my other job because if I didn't have that, it, it's, it can be, it's rough. Um, now I, I've learned my, te now I also teach photography classes in addition to my other teaching job uh, at the arts center. And so during winter, I try to um, focus on uh, still life inside winter window light for portraits and still life subjects. Um, it can be beautiful, but, you know, so it's all about balance. You know, the light comes into balance when the space, you make the time and, and have the space to do your work and, and finding the right balance, the images start, they're going to come because it's almost like you, you let go of that stress. You let go of the stress of also of over expecting are trying to over plan your photography too much. And I've learned that it's another good point is um, not to go into these places always expecting, I'm gonna shoot this, 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 and not be open to any other possibilities. And I can't tell you how many times I've gone into um, to some scenic areas uh, that I know that I really love to photograph. And it's always this shot that I'm not expecting that becomes the best image from the session or the outing or whatever. So uh, that's pretty cool. That's fun to me. It's, but but you got to be open. In order to be open, it's important to not go into these places um, stressed out, um, you know, limiting yourself with just a little bit of time and things like that. Uh, so it's it's really, you know, taking the time to uh, go out and shoot. And I, I tell this to these, my photography students is, is a lot of times, you know, that uh, the jobs, they have their families, um, they go on vacation and they try to do their nature and landscape photography and they've got their kids and their spouse saying, you know, hurry up. <laughs> we, we need to get to dinner, you know? So it's like, um, it, it, that's tough. And you know, I've been there. I've been there. I know it. And it's all part of life. I get it. So um, you always, you got to carve out your time to do this and do it well. You got to carve out your time, uh, you know, set a full day aside. You're going to go out. You're going to go this place. You've got kind of got a feeling you're going to capture this, this, and this, but you're going to stay open. You're going to, you know, in, in addition to bringing your wide angle lens and your telephoto, you're going to bring uh, just a, your macro lens because you never know it might be on the trail at your feet as you're going along to the um, the particular area you want to photograph. So yeah, that's what I mean by staying open and being prepared. So that's very important. And then the the tutorial video I just posted, I mentioned the the benefit of shooting with prime lenses. Uh, prime fixed focal length lenses are are fun because they make you get in close to the subject, not rely on a zoom to go back and, you know, zooming in and out. You have to work to get to the angle, physically get to the angle um, that's going to make the shot. So that's really important. Um, so, yeah, I just, the social media, um, the crowds, I don't know what's going to happen. I know Hocking Hill State Park just instituted a shuttle system out of the city of Logan. Um, whether or not that helps or not, I don't know. I just think the, the weekend crowds there have gotten so much. The people are lined up. The cars are lined up. It concerns me because it's it's a kind of a delicate ecosystem there with the sandstone and the hemlock forest. Um, it's not real hard ground, so it's very susceptible to erosion more so than any other uh, landscape in Ohio. So if there's heavy traffic, there's garbage, there's uh, you know all that stuff it's going to accumulate. And it, to me, it's almost like it starts to suck the, the spiritual energy of a place out. 
is that's what I mean by being loved to death. And so um, it's not only there, but it's in um, in the national, the most the best known national parks too. So what what are we going to do as a society? Or is is it the trend going to stop when we don't put so much emphasis on these um, Instagram selfies and this addiction to likes um, on Facebook and Instagram? And we kind of let that go and get back to really um, being in a place and appreciating it and learning it and respecting it and teaching that to our kids, the next generation coming along too, to, to respect it. I'm seeing hopeful signs with that next generation. I, I think they, they get this because they're seeing it. And I think they're like, yeah, this isn't kind of what we think it should be. Uh, I'm hearing comments from um, the 20 somethings. And especially when they see garbage out on the trail, uh, they get infuriated. Um, so it's then rightfully so. So it's like, I think there is going to be, it's like it ceases, right? Things will be, something will happen, hopefully, to get things back in balance before um, any permanent damage is done to these, these beautiful, beautiful places we call our state national parks. Um, so as photographers, what can we do? Um, I think we can uh, stay committed to uh recording these places and our images, but recording it in a way that kind of demonstrates a sign of honoring and respecting the place. And when people see that, they'll come across the images and maybe, you know, when they go into these places, they'll have a little bit more reverence for them. Okay. So, uh, but as professional nature and landscape photographers, I think that's a, that's a huge part of our responsibility. I, I mean, our ethical responsibility as wild and wildlife photographers, especially, you know, honoring the subject, respecting the subject and not harassing or causing ill health to the subject um, to the point where you're endangering the animal. Um, there's the top wildlife shooters out there, you know, like Art Wolf. Um, they're like, that you see it in the work. They respect that subject. They're not harassing it. So um, they set the example, right? So we got to keep setting that example because <laughs> um, there's, is, I think there's so much more um, to be appreciated in these places when we learn to uh, protect and preserve them and in not, um, it's not just like a giant playground, right? Where, um, People can go in and do feel they can do whatever they want as long as they get the Instagram shot. So I think that's um, really essential. And so as photographers, we need to have to carry that responsibility of um, fulfilling that mission, that ethical mission, so to say. So I want to, you know, in the comments here, um, let me know what you think. Uh, let me know what you think about, you know, finding your own local place. You know, if you've got a spot, um, you don't have to identify it, but say, hey, yeah, I've got my spot I go to. And it's so nice going in there and just having it to myself because then I can really get the images that I know that speak of my connection to this place. So it's that's very important. So let me know. And if you disagree thinking, no, nah, Instagram's a great thing. <laughs> I think we see you know, more people, the better, because the more people that are shooting with Instagram, I think it's more fun or whatever. If that's what you feel, you know, say it. Um, I kind of disagree. I just think it just it just kind of cheapens these uh, these places that we should be honoring a bit. And uh, so that's that's my thought on that. So um, want to mention real quick this Saturday. Uh, June 9th, um, 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. I'm doing an introductory photography workshop uh, for those just starting out like with their first uh, uh, DSLR camera uh, at the Middletown Art Center, Middletown, Ohio. So if you Google Middletown Art Center, Middletown, Ohio, um, 
they'll come up and it's you can register it's time still time to register it's forty dollars per person you register through the website for Middletown Art Center and I really have fun I love to teach um, I love to see um, uh, people kind of awaken to the creative vision that's hidden inside of them and they get past the nervousness of all this technical uh, knowledge that it seems to be overwhelming sometimes with these digital cameras and the digital editing workflow. I, I try my best at simplifying that and making it approachable and easy to understand. So you learn how to make these tools work for you so you can get in more into these beautiful places and create the kind of work that you really love. Um, so that workshop, then I've got a fall workshop in Hockey Hills. It's Thursday and Friday, October 11th through 12th. Um, so that's this October, October 11th to 12th, Thursday and Friday at the Inn at Cedar Falls and Hockey Hills State Park. To register, you just email me and I'll put you on my list. I just need your name and email address and email me at jim at jimcrotty.com. So jim at jimcrotty.com and say, hey, I want to sign up for your October workshop. It's $150 per person, and that's for a day and a half of instruction. And also, the, the weather permitting on the Thursday evening, uh, the skies are clear. I'll add in a little session on night sky and Milky Way photography as well at the end. Um, beautiful night sky, um, one of the darkest skies in Ohio over there at Hockey Hills. So, um, and then we go out and shoot, we come back, I have a perfect classroom there at the inn at the gathering space. It's a beautiful conference room meeting facility and it's right in the middle of the park. So we're centrally located. So I've been teaching at, out of the inn, the Hockey Hills Nature and Landscape Workshop since 2009. So it's hard to believe that almost I'm coming up on 10 years. And, um, but it's every group's a blast. Every group has their own kind of little personality. If you talk to somebody who's taken one of my workshops out there, just ask, they'll tell you how much fun it really is. So um, I really mix it up with actually going out shooting, spending enough time doing the digital editing works, workflow. And I work in Lightroom uh, primarily. So it's a lot of fun, but we, we, we have a lot of fun as a group and, um, and, yeah, it does work out to get out there on Thursdays and Fridays rather than a weekend because um, at least we've got a, a not so much of a crowd to, to work with. So uh, this Saturday, the Middletown Arts Center, um, Milwaukee Hills on October 11th and 12th, and I'm going to be doing more of these live feeds um, to see if we generate more interest, and then also doing I'll be posting more tutorials uh, throughout the summer and hopefully that will be something you really like. If there's something you want as a photographer, as a new photographer or experienced photographer or whatever, you know, say, hey, Jim, how'd you, I know it's this image, how'd you do this image? How'd you, you what were your camera settings? Um, how'd you go about setting up the shot and things like that? Or if there's a question about, I've got this DSLR camera and I'm not confident to going over to manual. Can you do a video about how to manage your, your camera and manage it well in that manual exposure mode and coming out of full auto and, um, or, you know, uh, just any topic you think can think of that you want me to help you with, I'll be happy to, um, consider it and maybe put a tutorial video together. It'd be fun. So, so good. Thanks for joining me tonight. And I'm going to um, sign off for now, but I'll be back on uh, next Wednesday at eight o'clock. And, um, and I'll announce what the kind of general, I always like to pick a kind of a general type of topic. So I'll think of something that'll be fun to talk about. So yeah, thanks a lot and have a good night. Thanks. Oh, in stream, right? Yeah. <laughs>